Welcome to Profit Boss Radio, where successful women have paved the road to their own financial freedom. Each week, your host, Hillary Hendershot, financial coach, money mindset expert, and experienced wealth manager, will help you discover the keys to the wealth and peace of mind you want and deserve in her no-nonsense and authentic style, starting right now. Welcome to episode 56 of Profit Boss Radio. I'm Hillary Hendershot, your host and trusted advisor on your journey to financial freedom. Today's episode is called What Your Financial Advisor Isn't Telling You. That's the baby in the background. Listen, guys, sometimes you just got to get an intro recorded and I'm on baby duty. So Harlan might be talking to you today. So uh, it's a very provocative episode title, right? And actually, it turns out to be extremely timely because the very thing we're going to be talking about today is the fiduciary rule, which turns out to be a really hot media topic this week. My guest today is Professor Ah! Antoinette Shoar of MIT. What Professor Shoar wants you to know is that there are some financial advisors who are fiduciaries and some who aren't. And it's really important that you know what choice you're making. And this turns out to be a really hot media topic because recently President Donald Trump said he's going to get involved in some legislation that affects the financial advice industry. You may have heard of the Dodd-Frank Act and the fiduciary standard. Basically, there was a federal regulation set to go into effect that would make all financial advisors fiduciaries. We've known about this rule for a long time, and it was going to become law in April. But now Trump says he wants to review it, so it's delayed definitely and canceled maybe. If you want to read my summary of that issue, please come over to the blog at HillaryHendershot.com. I've got an article about it. We'll link to it in the show notes at HillaryHendershot.com forward slash 56. Let's get back to today's guest. Antoinette's bio is really impressive. She's a professor of entrepreneurial finance at the MIT Sloan School of Management and the chair of the MIT Sloan Finance Department. She has a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago and an undergraduate degree from the University of Cologne in Germany. She is associate editor of the Journal of Finance. Her research interests span from entrepreneurship to and financing of small business to household finance and intermediation in retail financial markets. She received several awards, including the Brattle Prize for the Best Paper in the Journal of Finance and the Kaufman Prize Medal for Distinguished Research in Entrepreneurship in 2009. She has been published in the Journal of Finance, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, and her work has been featured in The Economist, The Financial Times, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. She's also the co-founder of Ideas 42, a nonprofit organization that uses insights from behavioral economics and psychology to solve social problems. Without further ado, me and my eight-month-old daughter, Harlan Hendershot, welcome you to episode 56 of Profit Boss Radio, What Your Financial Advisor Isn't Telling You. Professor Antoinette Shoar, welcome to Profit Boss Radio. Thank you very much for having me. Antoinette, tell us, why did you decide to become a college professor? It sounds really like a very interesting life choice. What's it like? I enjoy it quite a lot. Um, I think it's uh, really, I feel very grateful to be able to work with so many fantastic students, young people who are really enthusiastic and bright and, you know, to have a chance to to in a way have some of this enthusiasm still in my life, even though I'm not that young anymore. Um, so that's a wonderful thing. And, and it's really wonderful to work with aspiring and, and uh, you know, young people that are at the beginning of their life. So what's the lifestyle like? You're a college professor at MIT. That sounds really impressive. I mean, do you feel like you have to be the smartest person in the room all the time? Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about it. I really hope not. So (laughs) I think that would be really obnoxious. And I really hope that I'm not. Actually, you know, the truth is that when you are here and you see so many wonderful people around you, and of course, many brilliant people, you would be very immediately told if you were trying to have a big head and, you know, kind of be arrogant or something, because you always see also your own limits if you want. But it's actually, you know, it makes you very modest and grateful, actually, because you see how much talent there is and 
the world. At the same time, I think what's really wonderful about MIT, and, you know, I mean, obviously there are many other good universities, but I know this one really well. You know, what's really wonderful is that people, it's not about being smart, right? It's about doing work that you're excited about that hopefully help in a small way to make the world a slightly better place and to have, you know, a chance to, to actually contribute to the, to the improvement of our understanding and our lives. And, and hopefully it's really not about showing off and being smart, but, but contributing. So do you have work-life balance as a professor? How many hours a week do you work? Are you a, are you a workaholic or are you like, my husband's a college professor and he mm-hmm. takes naps every day. Is it like... <laughs> I wish I should learn from your husband. (laughs) I would say, so it's true that I'm a little bit of a workaholic because also I really love my work and it, you know, kind of, I, I, I'm really interested in, in it and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm trying hard to have some work-life balance. And I would say what I'm super grateful about is that, you know, as an academic as a you know college professor what you do have is a lot of flexibility in your life to arrange your time and when you work um, and you don't have a boss who sits on top of you and tells you today you have to do this at 11 o'clock and you know kind of that at 4 p.m or something so those are things that I value very highly that I can be you know in control of my own time and when I do things um, and so sometimes I can take an afternoon off you know in the middle of the week when I know that the mall is not going to be full or you know kind of I can go with my niece and and you know kind of play in the park when there's not everybody else trying to um, and then I, I can work on a Saturday or Sunday so those are clearly benefits I feel of the college lifestyle. Right because your your career is still largely self-determined right? You get to kind of set the trajectory. And I mean, they expect you to publish, but largely, uh, I mean, there's a lot of aspects of entrepreneurialism in the college professor's career. Am I right? That's a good way of seeing it. I agree. It's like being self-employed. You have to find your own topics that you maybe because you're excited about them and you want to do research on them. It doesn't always mean that the rest of the world is, right? So you have to also understand what is it that people are interested in or that the world is interested in. And then you have to set that agenda yourself. And it's true that nobody, the benefit of having a boss, I think, is that, you know, somebody keeps you on track and makes sure that work gets done. And that's not so much true for us. We have to be quite self-directed in how we work. And so you're definitely right that it's a bit like being an entrepreneur or somebody self-employed. Right. I mean, I've always, I've always been someone who I have exercise and work out pretty regularly, but it's always a question mark when I wake up in the morning, what, when am I going to work out? And oftentimes when am I going to work out turns into, I'm not working out. But now that I joined this gym where they have this, there's just one class in the morning that works for me at 8.50 AM. It's not going to work for me at any other time. I've been been more regular by about a multiple of 2x. And so I've started to wonder, well, I wonder if I would be more productive if I had these boundaries everywhere. Like maybe I need a boss. (laughs) (laughs) But I think it's a very smart technique to create these routines for yourself. Yes. Uh, And I found that's true for me too. I mean, that's true a little bit in in work. You know, I I need to set deadlines for myself or I sign up for certain conferences so that I know I have to get this paper you know, finished before. And it's also true, like you said, in workout, for sure. Right. <laughs> I, you have I to kind to- of manage yourself sometimes. <laughs> and speaking of things that you're interested in, I saw something in your bio I wanted to ask about just really quick. What is Ideas 42? Ah, yeah. So Ideas 42 is a, a nonprofit that I started founded together with uh, some colleagues of mine from Harvard and Princeton that is aimed at taking insights from behavioral economics and psychology and cognitive science to solve real problems, social problems in the world. So what Ideas42 does is to work, say, on issues in consumer finance or in, you know, poverty, take up of poverty programs like you know, say food stamps or other things like that, Mm -hmm. and uses insights from behavioral economics in, say, how people, people's, like we were saying, issues with with procrastination or the fact that people um, sometimes get very emotionally and cognitively overloaded and then don't make good 
decisions for their own lives. You know, we, we develop, if you want, tools or techniques of helping them make better choices. And those, so Ideas 42 is not a research organization. It actually does real projects with real organizations. So, you know, we've worked with, say, we've worked with nonprofits or the U.S. government. We've also worked with banks that, and, and community savings banks that want to create more, if you want, programs that are more targeted to help people across a different, a bunch of different areas of people's lives. So you do things like get people to spend less or save more? Exactly. That or say um, get people who are, say, eligible for food stamps to actually sign up for food stamps or, I mean, believe How it or not. How did you do that? So we have some programs where, for example, just by simplifying the forms and the paperwork with which you apply for some of those programs makes a huge difference in the number of people apply, but also who applies. Um, because we have seen that sometimes the most needy are also the ones are least prepared to fill out these applications and maybe even to have the time or the understanding, right, to deal with all these things. And so then the most needy might not really have access to to these services that they should have access to just because, you know, they cannot deal with the administrative burden of doing it. You know, there's a study that now is actually almost 30 years ago, but it was one of the first studies to, to in a way, use this trick. So what they did is, you know, you, you are surely um, aware that in the U.S., you know, you can apply for financial aid and also for, for student loans with this form called FAFSA, which is, you know, kind of a form that asks, you know, for students. For everything you've ever done, everything exactly. you've ever earned, and yes, oh, everything you ever right? will do. Yes, I know. <laughs> this form has like, and you are, I know your daughter is still very young, yeah. but, you know, kind of at some point you might have to fill this out too. But it's, you know, kind of, it's almost hundreds of pages. And, and what in this experiment, what people did or in this pilot study is they, and we know that there are lots of people who are eligible to get financial aid or subsidized student loans. They're not taking it up, even though, you know, it would be beneficial for them. And so what they did in the study is they helped people and set them down at the time when, you know, they are, were supposed to apply for college and filled out the form with them and helped them to fill it out. And this was, you know, two to three hours of sitting with the people and filling it out. But actually, it's it had massive impact on not only the fraction of people having financial aid later on, but even people going to college. And so the the rate of people graduating from college in the group that, you know, that got the help just in filling out the form was more than 7% higher, which is huge, right? Everything else, when you look at things like giving people financial incentives to, to go to college and so on, even though these are very expensive programs, typically, um, they don't have the same impact. And so from a cost benefit perspective, helping people with these, if you want, relatively simple things can sometimes have very big impact. And so, you know, we do a lot of different type of uh, behaviorally informed interventions to help people with those types of things. Wow. So public and private institutions hire you and your colleagues from Harvard and Princeton to kind of go to work on these complex problems and you solve them using human psychology and knowledge of cognition and behavioral finance and things like this. That's right. And we have a wonderful team of staff who actually does all the heavy lifting. But yeah, we do this together. Very good. Okay, love it. All right. So you are an academic by trade. And you will forgive me if I say most academics aren't out there trying to be understood by the general public. And yet I found this article written by you and I knew I had to talk with the author. And it turns out that you're an MIT professor. What has you interested in the experience of actual investors? I would say a couple of things. Of course, I have, you know, my own experience and, you know, my own, especially, you know, kind of, uh, as you can hear from my accent, I, I'm not from the U.S., so I had to learn about the U.S. system and how things work here. I'm originally from Germany. And 
what in particular prompted me to think about, you know, financial advisors and how they work and how this whole market work works is that since, you know, I live here in the U.S. and I go home only mainly on Christmas, what would normally happen is that when I go home on Christmas, my mom would show me all her portfolio and, and you know, how she arranges her savings. And the first few times I would be I was really upset because I saw that her financial advisor had put her into very fancy sounding, but incredibly expensive products. Mm -hmm. In Germany in particular, they still have a lot of closed end funds, which in the US don't even exist so much anymore. But, you know, they, she would be in like, say, you know, shipbuilding funds. And it's, you know, my mom is not a magnet of any kind, <laughs> you know. So this is like, you know, kind of somebody's, you know, pretty modest retirement savings in some very exotic and ex fringe. exactly fringe product. And then what I would do is basically always each year I would go to her financial advisor and I would tell her, look, you have to take my mother out of all this stuff. This makes absolutely no sense. And I was thinking, how is this even possible that, you know, those, somebody would make those type of decisions for, for someone like my mother who has, you know, her type of risk aversion and portfolio. And I thought this is surely because the US is so, uh, sorry, Germany is so behind the US um, investment system. But then, you know, because of it, I became very interested in understanding better how this whole landscape of, you know, wealth management and financial advice looks in the US. And, and that's actually how I got started on that topic. Mm -hmm. And so can you say kind of in a nutshell, what is it? The title of the article is what your financial advisor isn't telling you. What, what is it that your financial advisor isn't telling you? So I would say what, what we find and what your financial advisor often isn't telling you is number one, that the best advice they can give you is to, to minimize fees for you. And the way you, you can do that is um, by being invested in well-diversified index funds that help you to diversify a lot of the day-to-day -day risk and what we in finance like to call, um, you know, the idiosyncratic risk. So the risk that one stock goes up and another one goes down, which might create a lot of volatility in your portfolio. This you can all actually get rid of in, in your portfolio if you diversify well through those what is called index funds. And what your advisors often don't want to tell you is that that's the, really the best way to invest your assets because what it allows you to do is not to take those type of risks that don't create any rewards in your portfolio. But, you know, kind of as a result, it also means that your advisors typically are not e able to help you beat the market or do better than the market. So what you should look out for is that your advisors really focus on providing you with a very well diversified portfolio via index funds. But that also then leads to having very low fees. You should not trust advisors who put you into exotic securities like the one that, you know, my, my mom was in. No because, shipbuilding. Right. <laughs> so that's at a minimum, right? But <laughs> no shipbuilding, no say. To be very honest, don't let your advisor put you into, say, things like, one commodity funds like gold or, you know, one individual thing. Number one, as I said before, it, it exposes you to a lot of this idiosyncratic risk. In addition, those funds typically have very high fees. And the best you can do for yourself is to really minimize, minimize fee income. I love it when I find people, especially people who are academics, because you don't really have a horse in the race, as, as we say, you know, you don't have any motivation to tell people anything that isn't true because you aren't making money based on how people invest. Now, I obviously, even as a fiduciary advisor, I do make money when people invest with me. So I think it's critical to have people on this show who are credible, who are reiterating what I say, which is you have this matrix of decisions, but you can really make it simple for yourself because once you narrow it down to an advisor who is a fiduciary and who is using in an index based or an asset class mutual fund investment option, you know, that kind of 
it, it can make your choices pretty simple if you kind of just follow that that matrix. Are you? Would you agree with that? Yes, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think you're bringing up a very important dimension, which is the fiduciary standards. It's actually surprising that you know in the U.S. Right? I mean, th- there is two types of registrations, if you want, that an advisor can have. It's the fiduciary standards, and then there's something else, which is called the suitability standard. Now, suitability doesn't sound so bad as a word, right? But um, if you look at what the regulation says, is that suitability just means that the level of say, quality of advice that, you know, your investment professional has to provide to you is only that they have to not defraud you, you know, and they don't, they are not supposed to put you into funds that are, say, fraudulent. But that's actually very minimal if you think about, you know, what you want from your financial advisor. Yeah, it sounds pretty bad when you say it that way. Absolutely, right? I mean, you would think, so a fiduciary, an advisor who has fiduciary standards agrees to put the client's interest first and to not act against the interest of the client, which in a way seems a no-brainer in what you want from an advisor, right? Yes. Um, but this is the, the, in a way, the firms that are signing up that are, I mean, or say not signing up to the fiduciary standards, they're basically saying that they want the freedom to not have to put their client's interest first. And that is obviously, you know, kind of a, a bit concerning. Now, to be more concrete about it, right? It's, for example, if your advisor only has suitability standard. For example, they are not required to minimize fees for the client. They can actually put the client in a relatively expensive fund and therefore, you know, lose a lot of money for the client. And so, you know, that's why I'm a big proponent of uh, having a financial advisor sign up to the fiduciary standards rule. I should say, sorry, go ahead. (laughs) Am I interrupting you midpoint? No, not at all. (laughs) Okay. So you actually conducted a study where you sent mystery shoppers to various financial advisors around Boston, right? To see what those advisors would say and recommend? Yes, in Boston and New York, actually. Boston and New York. And your mystery shoppers were told to intentionally communicate some level of bias or misunderstanding. What, What were those biases? Exactly. So we did this audit study or mystery shoppers and we had a range of different biases. So some of them would, for example, say that they believe that, you know, they can beat the market or that they want the advisor to help them beat the market by always readjusting their portfolio to industries that recently have done well. So in, in the investment world, people also call that return chasing, right? Uh-huh. You're always chasing the last wave, the last trend. Um, and all the data that we have on stocks, but also in mutual funds show that that's actually a very bad strategy for the client because a fund or it's like industry, jumping into the real estate market exactly. after the boom already happened. Absolutely. That's exactly the way to think about it, right? It's once there has been a run up, you go in and then most likely you will actually be there for the ride down, but not, you know, for, for the good returns. Now, if you think about it, though, for the advisor, that's a client who has a very convenient bias because it's a client whose portfolio you can change all the time and make a lot of fee off of that client. If you make money on trading costs, yes. Exactly. If you make money on trading costs. So what do the advisors say to these people? Right. So unfortunately, what we found is that a large fraction of them actually didn't give the clients the right advice, they actually encourage them to do more of this type of trading behavior. And they, we call it, they did not debias the client or they didn't teach them that in fact, this type of return chasing is not a good strategy. Mm. We also found that, say, you know, there are other type of biases that clients might have. That and um, where the interest of the client and the interest of the advisor are less at odds, right? They are less, uh, you know, going in the in the opposite direction. So 
one example is that there is one bias that people have, have found in the data a lot is that people tend to over invest in their, the stock of the company where they work. I don't mean, you know, that they're the founder of the firm. It's just, you know, if they're an employee mm -hmm. at a firm, say, you know, General Electric or so, and they like where they work and they feel that they know their company, they tend to overweight that firm in their retirement portfolio. That's also the data shows a really big mistake that you can make. The reason is that it's, first of all, as we were discussing before, it's never good to have a lot of money just in one stock. On top of it, right, your whole career already depends very much on how well your company is doing. Your promotion might depend on it, whether you get a bonus might depend on it. So you don't want to also have your retirement savings tied to the fortune of this one company. You want to be more diversified. And The interesting thing of this bias, however, is if you think about the financial, your financial advisor has an interest to tell you that that's a bad choice. Why? Because a financial advisor doesn't gain from the fact that you're just stuck in this one stock, right? So they oh, actually. Oh, I see what you're getting at. So you see what I'm getting right, at? The, the financial advisor, how do I say this? Could make money yes. by diversifying you. Exactly. And right? it would be good for you too. Exactly. Right. Okay. So your incentives and his, or your objective and, you know, your financial advisor's objective in this particular case are tied together. Right. Or they go in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And there what we do find is that in those cases, the financial advisors tell the clients that it's a bad idea to be stuck in your company's stock. So your study is not making financial advisors look very good. But you see, it's true. <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, you know, in that case, they give the, the client the right advice, right? They tell them that they need to diversify. So, you know, why I'm bringing this up is to say that financial advisors clearly, it's not that they are bad people and they, so, you know, when you say that I don't make them look good, I mean, I don't want to say that, you know, they deliberately or intentionally want to harm their clients. But what seems to be the case is that their incentives are stacked in a way that they want to make money of their clients. So what they respond to is to their own incentives, right? right? And so in, unfortunately, in many cases, the financial advisors might put you or have an incentive to put a, a customer into funds that have high fees. Mm -hmm. And the funds that have high fees are often normally not the index funds, right? But these actively managed funds that have very high fees and maybe high loads. So, and, and I think this idea of whether or not your advisor is a fiduciary is, is kind of esoteric and intangible for some right. people. I mean... In my opinion, my experience is that most people are likely to choose a financial advisor or to not leave a financial advisor based on how they feel when they're with him, right? right? So is there a way to make this distinction really tangible for people? I mean, maybe the best way to really quantify it is to do some kind of future value calculation of the potential of lost returns in terms of what those high fees and underperforming actively managed funds cost you. But right. do you know of a better way or another way to really quantify what does not having a fiduciary on your side really cost you? At least, you know, in our data, what we saw is the following. So we found that fiduciary standards advisors were much less likely to direct people to high fee funds. They were much more likely to put the clients into index funds um, that are low fee, while the, the non-fiduciaries were doing the opposite. Now, just a, a simple back of the envelope calculation. So the, the average difference in fees between the actively managed funds and those index funds that are low fees, even in our data, was almost a percentage point. Yeah, it's a lot. So it's actually really a lot. And what is sometimes, you know, what I think happens to people is when you say, oh, it's only a percent, they think, oh, a one percent out of a hundred, that's not a lot. But actually, that's not the calculation to make, right? It's one percent of your returns on your portfolio goes 
to your advisor or, you know, the funds that the advisor puts you in. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about it, typically, if you are lucky on an annual basis, not lucky, but if let's say if you have a good portfolio and a well-structured portfolio in an average year, you might make currently maybe, you know, six to seven percent on your portfolio annually. So now losing what you should think about it is that you're giving up 1% of the 6% that you're making annually. So now you can see that's a big fraction, right? That's almost 20% of the money you make in your portfolio. And I think people really need to understand that when even when we talk about half a percent or 1% difference in fees, this is a huge difference in what is left for them out of the returns on their money. Yeah, so you're costing yourself a significant portion of what could be your retirement portfolio, your, Absolutely. your ticket to financial freedom. And you make this really interesting point in the article about the fact that by the time you learn whether a retirement strategy or an investment strategy was the right choice, it's usually too late to change it. And you tie that to the data telling us that most Americans are not well prepared for retirement. We kind of all know, we've all heard those reports. And I think that that's really interesting because most people assume that the lack of preparedness is for a lack of strategy, not because of a failed strategy. Is it your impression that a significant number of people would say, hey, you know, this retirement thing, we gave it a go, we followed someone's advice, and it turned out to be the wrong advice? I think, yeah, you're making a very interesting point, right? How does the fact that people might have realized that their advisor wasn't maybe doing the perfect allocation, does it make them, you know, less likely to, to invest more or save enough or even, you know, leave the advisor altogether? Right. So what we've seen in the data is that, unfortunately, a lot of people go out of the market completely when the market goes down, right? So say, you know, they might be invested and then you have a downturn and not of course, it was particularly dramatic and particularly harmful after 2008. Right. But we see this actually in every uh, market downturn. What happens is that a, a significant fraction of customers seems, or uh, sorry, of, of savers seems to then completely pull out of the market and not go back into the market for several years. Right. And in fact, that type of investment strategy is what is particularly harmful because what happens is that you lose on the downturn because you are in the market, right? When it crashes. And so even if because maybe you, you buy high and you sold low. <laughs> absolutely. And now what happens is you pull into cash when the market is low and you miss when the market recovers again, because if you think, you know, imagine the, even this very horrible 2008 crisis, if you pulled out in say end of 2008, and then you stayed out of the market for four years or even three years, you would have missed a really big portion of the recovery and your portfolio would then really have been would have suffered a lot. And I, because, you know, like you said, you, you bought high, um, sold low and didn't even buy back in when it was low. Right. right? And I feel that's why it's so important to have, you know, a, a fiduciary advisor who helps you understand that markets are volatile, but that you are, you have a strategy in place that helps navigate the ups and the downs or say the downs and the ups of the market, right? And that you can trust your advisor that you will actually stay in the market, you know, even when the market goes down so that you can benefit from the recovery. And everyone who listens to this show has been admonished against sitting in cash. I have I have really taken them to task because the women who listen to this show need to be building that investment portfolio. And that's never done if you're sitting on the sidelines in cash. So thank you for reiterating that point. And so I think really that the lesson learned here is that conflicts of interest do matter. 
And that whether or not you like the person who's giving you advice is really irrelevant to the legal boundaries of your relationship, that those incentive structures matter, and that what your research has shown is that they do inform the advice that people get, and that you should look for an advisor who's a fiduciary and recommends a low-cost index or asset class-based portfolio. I totally agree. And I I think, you know... I understand that people want an advisor who they feel comfortable with on a personal level. But, you know, there's a, even among the fiduciaries, right? You have a lot of choice of the character and the personality. So if I have to give advice, you know, to friends of mine, I always tell them, look, just start with people who are fiduciaries. And then among them, go shopping, right? Find the person who you like. If that's something you value, and I understand that you value dealing with people who are nice, but, you know, do it in the set of people where you know that the incentives are aligned with you. Don't do it in the set of people where, yes, the person might be nice, but his or her hands are tight because the incentives that are set up, even for that nice person from the institution that they work with, works against you, you know? Yes, yes. Perfect. Thank you so much, Professor Shoar, for your words of wisdom. I think um, it's been fantastic to hear your perspective on what I do think is an important issue, especially where living longer and, and healthcare is more expensive. And so, you know, we need we need that money and we Absolutely. need to figure out how to bring the right people into our our cohort of trusted advisors to to make things happen for us. So I, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate what you're doing. Hey, Profit Boss. Yes, you. Lean in here. I've got something to tell you. Do you remember that movie Mean Girls with Lindsay, whatever her name is, and the fabulous Tina Fey? It was all about this group of in-girls, the plastics. And Lindsay Lohan plays the new girl who wants desperately to be part of the clique. You get the picture. Tina Fey was hilarious in that, by the way. Did you know she wrote it? Anyway, I want to tell you about another group on Facebook. It's nothing like the plastics. I mean, come on, we're not in high school anymore. And seriously, it's much cooler to lift each other up instead of tearing each other down, don't you think? Because as we all know, as women, it can be tough to know who to trust when it comes to getting real about money. That's why I'm so proud of all the courageous women in the Profit Boss Facebook group. It's kind of like hanging out with your best friends. You know, ladies who've earned the right to be called your friend because you're not afraid to show a little bit of vulnerability. It's like that. And by the way, we let the men join too. So if you want to be part of a group of wholehearted women and men who aren't afraid to grow and support each other, give us a visit and bring your friends. Just go to hillaryhendershot.com forward slash profit boss and you'll immediately be redirected to a place where you can request admission, which we will give you willingly. I'll see you on the inside. Thank you for listening to Profit Boss Radio, where creating success on our own terms happens every day. You're not alone in your journey to a rich life, and that's why Hillary is here to add value in each and every episode. See you next time on the podcast for women and money.